Welcome, everyone. We're heading back to Todi. And you're soon going to see that there's a lot more to discover in the world's most livable town, Todi. As mentioned in my first lecture, this appellation was given to the town by a University of Kentucky professor of sustainability some years ago. He talked in my first talk on why it is the world's town. If you miss some of the reasons it is, and tonight we'll talk about others, and if you miss the first talk, I really suggest checking it out as soon as you can after this one. Today we're going to be talking about Todi uniting together two very uh, interesting artistic forms or significant artistic forms of this town, the medieval art, history, and architecture with contemporary art. And we're going to be meeting some interesting individuals who chosen to live in the world's most livable town and who are not Italians. Let us start our talk with a visit to the Duomo, which rises proudly on the north end of the town at the end of the Piazza del Popolo, the main square. The origins of Todi's Duomos are really lost in time. Santa Maria della Nunziata, the, it is dedicated to the Assumption, is the name of this Duomo. And this is a 13th century structure built on the site of a pre-existing structure Structure, which underwent devastation in 1190 due to a fire. But that building had probably already been built on site of a Roman temple. As we've learned again and again in many of my lectures, what, what was a significant religious site for a people remains a significant religious site. And many of the great churches of this country are built on the site of pre-existing Roman or Etruscan temples. The facade church is 13th century, but it was modified various times up until the beginning of the 15th century. There was devastation in the church due to fires, earthquakes, and even at times the collapsing of the ceiling. Here we see the Piazza del Popolo, and as you can see, Todi's uh, Cathedral, the Duomo, is at the north end of the piazza. At the south end is the Palazzo dei Priori, a magnificent 14th century civic building, and two other civic buildings of the 13th century flank it will be talking about these buildings. But let us return a moment to the Duomo, Santa Maria Annunziata. Uh, the structure here that we're seeing results from work uh, undertaken between the 13th and 16th century. Restoration of the facade is also due to the generous input of an important bishop of Todi, Angelo Cesi. He was bishop from 1566 to 1606 for 40 years. And he um, commissioned much of the work on the restoration of the facade. We want to have a look at the beautiful rose window. It was started in 1515, finished in 1523. It's really an exquisite piece of lace, isn't it? There's a pigeon right here, too, who is enjoying sitting out, taking in the sun in the rose window, the rosone, as it's called in Italian. Um, the, below the rose window is the beautiful door, the wood on it, the upper level, sculpted by Antonio and Sebastiano di Bencivenga da Mercatello, Umbrian artisans working in wood in the early 16th century. The restoration of the facade was sponsored, as mentioned, uh, by Bishop Angelo Cesi in the 16th century. Now, um, part of this door was damaged, and the door was damaged by a lightning bolt striking it in the 16th century, and raging storm hit this church and ruined the door, destroyed the door really, in 1623. What remained was the upper part, the four panels of the Benchivenga, father and son. These were in walnut. The lower part, done later in the 17th century, is in oak. And here we can see the door, and I've got photos here of the detail of the sculpting along the sides of the door as well. It's really a masterpiece of wood carving. 
And these are the four panels in walnut that were done by the Ben Chivanga father and son team. The upper level is the Annunciation, the Virgin here. The angel Gabriel is kneeling before her. And below we have St. Peter and St. Paul. And they're flanked by beautiful sculptures here of fruit and vegetation and coats of arms, probably of the bishop at that time, who was reigning will uh, over the church in toady above this door the door is below and above it is the rose window between the door and the rose window is the coat of arms we see it up here in closer detail of angelo chesi that toady bishop who did so much for his town and his coat of arms reigns above cristo benedicente christ in blessing Look at, look at really, I mean, when I stood under this and took this photo up there, it was really as if this bearded Christ was looking down at me quite solemnly, quite gently and blessing me as I went into the church. I think anyone who really looks at this sculpture has that sense when they go into this church. There are beautiful sculptures flanking the doorway. Look at these intertwining vegetation. There's the head here of a man. This is probably the head of Christ. These are heads of cherub, cherubs, beautiful foliage. And to the left is a coat of arms of one of the bishops of Todi of the 17th century. To the right is the coat of arms of the Capitolo della Cattedrale. That is the commission of the cathedral, those who undertook necessary and so forth for the Duomo. And then at the bottom of the steps, the central door we've been talking about is right here. At the bottom of the steps on the left is a coat of arms of a pope, Papa or Pope, Gregory the Fourteenth. Uh, hey, everybody who's not Italian. Um, Enrico will certainly know this. Your father is called your papa with an accent over the A. The Pope is papa without any accent. So please don't confuse this word with uh, your dad. This is Pope. Pope Gregory the Fourteenth, late 16th century Pope. And this is Papa Paolo Terzo or Paul the Third. 16th century Pope, and those of you who were able to hear my Perugia talk will certainly remember Paul III. Do you remember the massive papal fortress, La Rocca Paolina, built between 1540 and 1543 when the Perugini protested the salt tax, the heavy tax on salt, and fought the Guerre del Sale, the salt wars, if you remember. Now we're going up the steps and we're going into the Duomo. The floor is very beautiful, redone in the early 19th century in the pink and white limestone quarried on Mount Subasio, backdropping Assisi. And this Duomo or cathedral is a Latin cross. And we have the main nave crossed by a transept. And we're going to see that in this church, actually, there's four naves. The main nave, side naves, and another side nave, which they call a navatina, the little nave. And so we're looking at towards the altar. We've just entered the door, and I'd like you to observe these exquisite columns. We're going to see them a close up because every single sculptural masterpiece topping the columns and the pilasters as these are called is a work of art which the great art historian Ardolfo Venturi said merits its own story each column should be you know studied and written about now we have a different view of the duomo we're standing at the altar and we're looking out towards the back door. There's the rose window, and we have a ceiling which is called a campiata. It's wood, it's trust, and I believe it dates to about 18th century. It replaces a vaulted ceiling which had been erected under the reign of Bishop Chasey. Now let's return to the altar.
Over the altar, we have a beautiful mid-13th century crucifix, which we'll be talking about. And you can see that backing the altar is the choir. The choir stall is the work, again, of the father-son team, uh, Antonio and Sebastiano di Bencivenga da, Ma da Mercatalo. Look at the splendor of the inlay and the sculpting. Extraordinary perspective developed. These are two more sections of the 22 choir stalls. The crucifix over the altar. Here we can see it a bit closer, and let's see it even closer here. This is a Croce di Pinta. It's tempera on wood. It was painted in the mid-15th century, and as our historians would say in Italian, this is fortemente bizantineggiante, strongly Byzantine in its flavor and its depiction. To Christ's right, remember that's the most important position in art. We remember the Italian word for right is destra, and the Italian word for left is sinistra, and everybody would much rather be dextrous than they would be rather, rather be sinister. So on the right is the Virgin in great pain as she really is gazing on her son. On the left is John the Beloved. And here at the foot of Christ and kissing the feet is someone in a white habit. It is a Dominican and probably the sponsor of this crucifix, the comitente, he who paid for it. He who commissioned it, literally, comitente. Now let's look at a couple of these beautiful pilasters. As Aldo Venturi says and mentioned, I had mentioned, each column and pilaster merits a full description. <coughs> On the left, we have Michael the Archangel, and pardon me, he is thrusting his lance down the throat of the dragon, symbolizing the devil. And look at the curving foliage surrounding this image, absolutely exquisite. Curving foliage surrounding also the angel Gabriel here on the right. And on other pilasters are St. Peter holding the keys, symbol, his symbol, his iconographic symbol, and St. Paul holding the sword. <coughs> Excuse me, his iconographic symbol. And I'm just going to drink a little water here. And they're uh, beautifully enshrined in thrones. Look at the exquisite detail of Peter's throne. And the throne over St. Paul, completely different, and all this wavy, ruffled effect, really, of uh, the top of the throne. Uh, I spent a lot of time when I was in this cathedral under these pilasters and columns, absolutely fascinated. I think I must have been half an, half an hour to 45 minutes just observing the, the columns and pilasters. Another one, St. John the Evangelist, a writer of the gospel, one of the four evangelists. Remember the Italian word for gospel is Vangelo. An evangelist is a writer of the gospel. Look at John. His feet come right off the base. And he's writing the gospel. And he kind of looks surprised. It's like what he's saying. And it seems to me that the eagle, which is his symbol, is whispering in his ear. <laughs> what should be written down? It's almost, you're kidding, I have to write that? That's what it seemed to me to be this scene. And here, too, we're noticing the exquisite foliage. Look at how the leaves curve. Absolutely stunning. All in limestone. This is, here we're seeing two of the columns. Each a work of art. Oh, as you're standing at the altar, here are these stunning columns, which we've been observing, and the pilaster, pilaster here, pilaster here. They alternate with the columns. And the purpose, obviously, is to hold up the walls dividing the naves, right? We're looking back at the beautiful fresco, the Judizio Universale, which would be um, the universal judgment, literally translated, we call it in English, the last judgment, this was painted in 1596 by a painter that, who was nicknamed Il Faenzone, 
the big guy from Faenza, big in the sense of important, probably, Faenza in Emilia Romagna. His name is Ferrau Fenzoni, and his Giudizio Universale, or Last Judgment, is very reminiscent of the great Last Judgment done in the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo, must have been about 40 years before this. And the scenes are reminiscent of Michelangelo's paintings as well. Look at the wonderful work done inside the arch above the rose window. Here is the condemnation of the damned, the calling of the elect, very, very strongly influenced by Michelangelo's um, Sistine Chapel fresco. Now we're looking again at the altar and here you can see La Navatina, that is this fourth nave. So we have main nave, uh, nave on the left, nave on the right, and yet a fourth nave constructed at a later date which the locals call La Lavatina, uh, La Navatina. I was in there on one of my many, many visits to Todi. I was in there alone, and there was just one young man sitting for a long time praying before this Christ. And this Christ is a 16th century, uh, excuse me, 1600s, 17th century processional crucifix um, you learned about those in my talk on Good Friday in Assisi. Remember we learned about Holy Thursday night, the scavigliazione, the denailing, the taking down of the Christ from the cross. This cross, too, was made in such a way that the Christ could be taken off the cross and carried in procession on Good Friday. So this is a processional cross of the 17th century. Behind Christ is a painting, it's this one here, by Giannicola di Paolo. He um, worked in, he did this painting in 1516. He worked with Perugino, the great artist of Perugia, and he was apprenticed to him. But he was also exceptionally good, and he also worked on many commissions on his own. We have an image here of the Madonna enthroned with a Christ child. To her right is Catherine of Alexandria. She was martyred, I believe, 4th century. We have her holding the palm, symbol of martyrdom, and the wheel. She was drawn and quartered on the wheel. Um, two, she's the most important because she's on Mary's right. On her left is San Rocco, actually from France, Roque. And he was a saint in the Middle Ages who administered to those ill with plague on their way to Rome. He's our pandemic saint. And often a painting to San Rocco is done as an ex voto, a prayer to the Lord for protection during an outbreak of the bubonic plague. And this could have been done at that time during a plague outbreak. <clears throat> and now we have a view of La Navatina, the nave. We're, we're behind the processional cro cross here, the processional Christ. And right at our back would be the painting I just showed you. And I wanted to show you the detail of a couple of these columns here in the Navatina. They're really exceptional, aren't they? And we're going to be talking about the baptismal font, which is right here. And there, let us zero in on the baptismal font. And this was done by Pietro da Lugano in the early 16th century, a beautiful sculptural work. And behind it is a window by Elise, Eliseo Fattorini, this is the artist. This was done in 1860, and this is depicting the baptism of Christ. And the image is actually copied from a fresco done by Perugino of the baptism of, of Christ. Uh, also in the Navatina is a fresco called La Trinita, or Il Trinita, I think we'd say. No, La Trinita. Enrico, correct me, La O Il. <laughs> Il Trinita, because we're talking about the Trinity, I think so. And, um, right? La. La Trinita. No, we say the three. Okay. La Trinita. I've got Valeria here too, and 
Here's Valeria. Thanks, Valeria. Um, we have God the Father with a long, long beard looking quite sadly at his son who is crucified. Perched above the cross is the dove, the Holy Spirit. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This was painted by Giovanni di Pietro, Detto lo Spagna, which means called lo Spagna. He was called the Spanish one because he was born in Spain. He too was a, an apprentice to the great painter Perugino, but also has many commissions um, done just for him, done on his own separately from his maestro Perugino. This is quite extraordinary, the state of this fresco on the wall, because it is a fresco distaccato. It was detached from another place in the church in 1850. So put somewhere else. In 1958, they detached it again. This is the third place on this wall, let's hope it stays forever, where this fresco is now there for viewing. So a fresco distaccato, uh, taken off and put back. It's an extraordinary state considering what it's been through. And as I was going out the door on a recent visit, I noticed the beautiful, huge bronze bell. This bell was done in cast in 1743. It was commissioned by a bishop, Bishop Gualtieri. I'm suspecting this is his coat of arms. And it's on one side of the bell. Uh, on the front of the bell, as you're heading out the door, what you're seeing is this exquisite crucifix. Imagine this cast in bronze with even I-N-R-I -I over it, all these loops and swirls, even the drapery of Christ, one leg over the other. The skull here, a symbol of Golgotha, absolutely an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of bronze. And not only uh, the sculpting all around it, but on the top. Look at these figures. Another face here, another horrific face here. So this is the bell, which you see just before you go out the door, because you see now we're at the end of the Navatina. Here's the main nave, and we'll be heading right out the door. But we're not going out the door. We're going to head up the nave, go to the altar area, and take steps down to the left, because we can't leave the Duomo without going to the crypt. Uh, this is certainly the oldest part of the church, um, dates to really early 13th century. The walls going down to the crypt, I think it's been open to the public now as a museum since maybe 2014, if I'm not mistaken, or 2016. The walls are lined with stone remnants which date from the Roman period to the 19th century. So these are some of the images. This is the Longobard cross, Lombard. This could be as early as, I don't know, the 8th to 10th century. Uh, this was uh, a tombstone of a religious. Uh, the crypt was often burial place of, in this case, the burial place of the bishops of Todi. So there's images of bishops of Todi. And one of the things which I found most fascinating in the crypt is I could see looking at a distance that that image was either going to be Roman or earlier. And I got up close to it and read the explanation of it. And it said it was called Mars of Todi. It was 5th century BC. But hold on. This is a copy. The original is in um, a, a collection in Rome of Etruscan art. If not in the Vatican Museum, it would be in the Gregoriano, the Etruscan collection. And it was found in 1835 in Todi. And this statue of Mars is a votive statue because they call it Mars, but it really is a warrior. Look at the detail of the armor here. This warrior is holding a patera, which is the Etruscan plate or dish. You offer libations to the gods. So this warrior is making an offering to the gods for his safety, the safety of his before he goes into battle. An absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary piece. 
This is the um, church of the crypt, or shall we say the altar area of the crypt. And we want to talk about this beautiful sculpture here, which is just behind the altar. And the name of the sculpture is Sede Sapientiae, the throne of wisdom. This is a, third, a 12th century um, sculpture. It has been in the crypt as of 2014 because before that time it was in this church of the Todi, Santa Maria in Camucha, which is a late 12th century church. And it is then it has been moved to the crypt. And it is actually an extraordinary piece because this is a virgin made of two blocks of wood, two monolithic blocks. In one monolithic block, the Virgin was sculpted, and her hands are movable so that she can hold the child. The child was sculpted in another monolithic block, set into the hands of his mother, seated on her lap, and then attached to her with a kind of iron hinge. Absolutely extraordinary and most unusual. There were many reliquaries in the crypt area uh, bearing tidbits of saints. This is the base of a, um, um, this is a 15th century reliquary. This is the base of another reliquary. This is a 15th century reliquary in silver of Santa Denia, a third, fourth century martyr saint of Todi. And as mentioned in my first talk on Todi, Todi has five Santi Protetori, or protector saints. One is Santa Denia, a martyr. And this is some tidbit of Santa Denia is right in here, right, where people could venerate it. This is a Santa Denia reliquary, reliquario. This is um, containing a tidbit of San Fortunato. He's patron saint of Todi, 6th century bishop. This is another reliquary. And this reliquary is of the 18th century. It is sculpted in wood and gilded. But it is over a reliquary which is even older, 15th century. And this part of the reliquary is brass and crystal. They're really, really extraordinary pieces. And I found the hands quite bizarre. I wasn't sure if they meant to be hands in blessing or hands looking up and saying, heaven's up there. Or hands saying to us, come here. But all these reliquaries shaped like hands have this position. I haven't been able to find in my research the significance of the position, and I haven't been able to talk to anybody who, who's uh, knowledgeable on it, but it's, it's uh, something I'm going to continue pursuing. Why, the, why this position and whatever for, and when, would, when did they start using this hand for the reliquary? These are other reliquaries in the collection. And here is a tidbit of Jacoponi da Todi. And we talked extensively about him in my first talk. He is buried in the Church of San Fortunato, an extraordinary saint, a protagonist of medieval poetry. He composed over 100 lauds, laudi, um, including the Stabat Mater. The Sorrowful Virgin standing at the foot of the cross, which is sung in our Good Friday procession. And he almost seems to have a twinkle in his eye here. And I'm wondering if it's because he's thinking about Pope Boniface VIII that he denounced and later had him excommunicated. And that's a tidbit of something of Jacoponi of Todi. This is a reliquary of Filippo Neri, 16th century state, a saint. Some piece of him is in here. And this is a reliquary said to have a piece of Santa Barbara. And I believe she's a third century, if not fourth century saint from Lebanon. So these are some of the unusual reliquaries in the crypt of the Church of Todi, the Duomo. Now we're going to go out of the Church of the Duomo, down the steps, across the square. Piazza del Popolo is the Palazzo dei Priori. This photo was taken when I was there um, shortly after the Feast of San Fortunato because these are the banners of the six Rioni or neighborhoods of Todi. These are other civic passes which we'll talk about, but right now we're going to leave behind the medieval, literally, go around the corner, walk down the back streets, 
because thanks to a guide of Todi, Elisa Picchiotti, who I met after the Festa of San Fortunato, and if you saw my first talk, there was a photo of Elisa um, in that talk. She told me about the painted house, and her stories absolutely fascinated me. And it was Elisa Picchiotti and a guide colleague of hers who've made the Casa di Pinto, or the painted house, known uh, now quite worldwide. And the Casa di Pinter painted house is down through the back streets of Todi. This is the walk there. Look at how beautiful through these back streets. Some of them vaulted. This one has a medieval doorway. Um, and I was walking through this alleyway, went down a street called the Via delle Murantiche, and I thought, ah, oh, that must be the street Elisa told me about it. And I looked inside a yard, which was closed off now for restoration, and I saw huge blocks of wall, and that's probably the wall that was pre-Roman of Todi, uh, 5th to 6th century B.C., but that was blocked off. I couldn't take any photos of it. But continued my walk and then came to the open doorway with a sign Casa di Pinta. Number 25. And at the top of the steps, a painted wall. And I went in. And interesting, this is number 25. The address is 25. I entered the house of great contemporary artist, Irish, Brian O'Doherty. This painting is called 25 Fives on a Blue Ground. Now, before we talk about Doherty and his wife, Barbara Novak, we must allude to another uh, artist who's made Toadie known to the world, really, the famed American sculptor of monumental works, Beverly Pepper. She's now a household word in Toadie, especially since the inauguration of the Parco di Beverly Pepper of her monumental sculptures inaugurated in 2019. Beverly Pepper and her journalist husband, Curtis Bill Pepper, lived, settled in Rome in the 1950s, and they settled in Todi in the 1970s, soon drawing other artist friends to Todi, among them the acclaimed Irish artist Brian O'Doherty and his art history professor, critic, and wife, Barbara Novak. And they visited the Peppers in the early 1970s. And I think by 1975, they too had purchased a house in Todi. And at Barbara's urging, O'Doherty continually painted the house every time they visited it. And he called his painted house a work in progress. How I hope that someday he can return and put his hand to the walls again with his paintbrush of acrylics. But he's 94. They live in New York. And I understand from the great photographer George Tajit that he's had two strokes. He's 95. Barbara Novak is now 94. <laughs> But until t until two years ago, I think they the last time they came was pre-COVID, every time they came to Toadie, he painted. And this uh, kitchen area and dining room area is called a temple to Ohem. This is the 7th century ancient Celtic language, and it is pronounced Ohem. Now, I want to read something interestingly about Brian O'Doherty to you. He adopted the pseudonym Patrick Ireland in 1972 after the Bloody Sunday in Derry to protest the and denounce the British repressive norms and to protest British military presence in Northern Ireland. In 2008, as a gesture of reconciliation and to celebrate peace restoration in Northern Ireland, O'Doherty reclaimed his birth name. He no longer is Patrick Ireland. He's once again uh, Brian O'Doherty. He reclaimed his birth name during a burial ceremony of his alter ego on the grounds of the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin. And on the grounds of the Museum of uh, Modern Art in Dublin is the tombstone of Patrick Ireland. Isn't that something? 
what an amazing couple, amazing individuals. And so let's return to this temple to Oham, as it's called. Um, we enter into the house and we're, you know, see the, the painting here, the 25 fives on a blue ground, then very close to it is the kitchen. And then between the kitchen and the living area, on a lintel is painted the theme of the house. White letters on a blue background. One here now. Can you see these three letters? One here now. For O'Doherty explained in a text on his work of the art house, because we are a one who lives here, not everywhere, and now in the present, not yesterday nor tomorrow. The paintings on the wall of the dining area, Lord Vowels for Ordority considers them the music of language. These first primitive sounds uttered by children in their linguistic development. And on the table in front of the fireplace, there's all kinds of books about the two. And in one of the books, I took this photo of them, Brian O'Doherty and Barbara Novak. These are books about him. This is one of her books here. Quite an extraordinary couple. And then uh, after you leave the dining area, you see painted steps, seven high steps uh, leading up and on the left of the steps is a painting called the Dizionario di. It's a small square painted with every square is five strokes. Can you see this? Look at the hand is five, but in different colors. And these are a compilation of the use of the fives in his drawing and paintings. Each eye may be interpreted as self. So to the right of the painting Dictionario di I, or the Dictionary of Self, you head up seven steps for the seven colors of the spectrum, and you go into the sala or the living room. And on the right is his painting called A Song to Vowels, at the end of the dining room, we're seeing an installation. You can see the wires here. And this painting is called Trecento. So the name is really the number 300. Because in Italy, um, we call the 1300s Il Trecento, the year of the 300s. And this is a tribute to the artists of the 1300s, the Italian artists, who painted the great triptychs, the three-part altarpieces. And this is a tribute of O'Doherty to the artists in Italy of particularly the 1300s. And then let's return here. This is 300, and we're going to talk about what's over this uh, sofa here. This is um, 300 and this is called now and you can see an oculus here and it really incorporates the oculus. Behind here are the steps leading up to their bedroom and we're going to be on the other side of that oculus in a moment. And this is the living area, the sala. Now I just wanted to sh give you the sense of it without any words on it. These are the steps that came up from the kitchen dining area. Behind here are the steps that are going up to the bedroom. Now, let me identify all these paintings for you. A Song to Vowels, here and now. And it's always the five, the five eyes, myself. Now, I went up the steps. And the steps are all painted in the rainbow colors to the bedroom. At the top of the steps, I could see the beam ceiling and the open window here. And going up the steps is this oculus. 
And it really seemed to me that O'Doherty wanted to create another painting. Through the Oculus, he's creating another painting. He's creating a painting of the Sala. Look at that. That's a painting, isn't it? So we're on our way up to the bedroom. And at the top of the stairs, he did a painting which was pointillism. He decided he didn't like it. But Barbara did not want him to destroy it, so it remains at the top of the stairs. And now we're in the bedroom. And this is a photo by the great photographer, George Tatje. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Over the phone, he said, Anne, don't even worry how you pronounce it. He has two exhibits going on now in Todi. I can't wait to see them. I have to go back because my visits preparing for this talk, I just couldn't get to his photographs and he did many photos of the painted house he knew this couple I'm going to read to you a quote from him about um, O'Doherty and Barbara Novak now here we're seeing at the top of the stairs this is the bedroom and there are there are not any messages here or vowels but these are just reflections on the nature of windows and the nature of doors it said that, I don't know if it was George who told me that there weren't a lot of windows in this house with views of the Toady countryside. So he painted these windows for his wife, Barbara, and he painted her for her uh, dawn, twilight, and, um, and night, <coughs> excuse me, and the doors, um, and just showing a door that's open and a door that's shut. <clears throat> excuse me and this is the bedroom this is the way up from the sala the oculus which looks down into the living room the doors open the open doors the window and the one window that they have which looks out on a back street of toady over the bed is a painting that he called midday and on the left is odority's profile and on the right his wife's Beautiful beam ceilings. Look at how simple. Oh, I wish I had a photo of this. <coughs> Excuse me. This nightstand is just made of two pieces of broken cement. And we're looking at the bedroom, and behind us is the bathroom. You can see the bed. Over the bathroom is a rainbow. Um, a circle over the top, and there's a beautiful intermingling here of the simple colors of the beige marble and the bright colors of the paintings of O'Doherty. Um, this is Vilma here telling me about the paintings in the bathroom, and she works for Co-op Cultura, and this is an association which now is responsible for the house. It's open to the public on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, if I'm not mistaken. But if anybody's going to Toadie and wants to see it, just let me know, and I can give you her contact information, and you can make an appointment. Uh, look at on the sink. These are the acrylics that O'Doherty used painting the house. Now, I want to, before we leave the painted house, I want to read some comments on it. Pier, uh, Maria Vittoria Malatesta Pierloni wrote about the, the painted house, and she wrote, The Casa di Pinta is not just a physical space, but a spiritual one as well, housing the mutual love of the Odority couple, as well as their shared passion for toady and for art, which becomes the maximum expression of and a reflection on a sense of belonging and identity. And George wrote this, the photographer, Brian and Barbara Doherty are two of the most extraordinary and special people I've met in my relatively long life. Brian, artist, art critic, filmmaker, novelist, but also a doctor. And although he never pursued a career in medicine after graduating in Dublin, and we have asked him several times, we've asked him several times for medical advice, and he's always been spot on. And Barbara, the top expert in 19th century American painting, a long career teaching at Barnard, and also a delicate watercolorist, not to mention all her wonderful books, including several novels. They are a handsome and beautiful couple in many ways, so different one from the other. 
Brian, the sharp pragmatist with a wild sense of humor and Barbara, the gentle spiritualist. They're loved by the entire town of Todi, which appreciates their opening the Casa di Pinta to anyone interested in learning more about contemporary art. And I have to thank George, also the photographer, the information he sent me on the Casa di Pinta, including a wonderful brochure, which is impossible really to find, and I'm so lucky to have a copy of it. The last line of this brochure shares the artist's aspirations, and it really struck me. The artist and his wife hope that visitors to the Casa di Pinta will not only enjoy the house as a work of art, but that the Casa di Pinta will be the only place on this planet planet whose inhabitants and visitors can read the ancient Irish language of Ohem. Ah, now we've left behind some contemporary art. We're going to return to medieval art. Opposite the Duomo is the primary seat of civic power, the mid 14th century Palazzo dei Priori where the civic magistrates of Todi stayed during their six months of office. Three priors would be elected during their six months of office. They could not leave the palace. They lived in actually the palace, probably to assure that they couldn't be corrupted by outside influences. This is a view of the palace during the festivities of the San Fortunato Disfida at the end of October, which we talked about in our first talk. And you can see here the um, banners of the six different neighborhoods of Todi hanging out the windows. The six Rioni, actually a neighborhood. And we can see the windows here. Let's observe the windows. There's two levels of windows and they're actually Renaissance in style rather than medieval. Um, they were sculpted in the early 16th century. And we see the eagle of Todi. This is an eagle in bronze uh, cast in the mid 14th century. It's a standing or it's perched above two of these Renaissance windows. This is the coat of arms of the city of Todi related to the legend, the ancient legend, uh, so-called um, founding of Todi due to an eagle. It said that pre-Roman times, um, people were having a lunch on a hillside near Todi. The tablecloth had been spread out. Can you imagine this? The tablecloth, pre-Romans. And an eagle swooped down, grasped the tablecloth in its claws, flew up the hill and dropped it, and they knew that's where Todi should be founded. So there's the eagle in his claws, the famous tablecloth. <laughs> Now, um, you can see that the Palazzo dei Priori is topped with Guelph battlements. They're squared off. And we remember that in the Middle Ages, there was always conflict between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines and the medieval city-states. The Guelphs supported papal power. The Ghibellines supported uh, the power of the Holy Roman Emperor. The Palazzo del Popolo next to the Palazzo dei Priori has Ghibelline battlements. The Palazzo dei Priori has Guelph battlements. So here we have again the Palazzo del Popolo with its Ghibelline battlements uh, built in 1213. Next to it is the Palazzo del Capitano and that palace is called Palazzo Nuovo. It's new. It was built in 1240. Uh, so it was newer than the one built in 1213. And this is graced with exquisite windows in really the Gothic Venetian style. These windows with the trilobed arches are very reminiscent of the windows of Palazzo dei Priori of Perugia. Some of you may remember my Perugia talk. And these date, uh, this palace dates from the 13th century all the way to the 15th as well. And you can see these beautiful little quadrifoils in the windows and the same quadrifoils here in the windows of the Palazzo del Capitano of Todi. These are coats of arms of civic authorities of Todi, another coat of arms here. And the steps lead up to this building, 
to the Sala delle Pietre, where they have exhibits, shows, um, gatherings of all sorts. And the upper floor hosts the Museum of Todi. But we're going into this building right here, the Sala delle Pietre. Um, it was inaugurated in 2016 after restoration, and it is, again, the building where they have um, shows, presentations of all sorts. Pino and I first saw it in uh, 2018 in December when we went to see the exhibit Beverly Pepper Trattodi e il Mondo. Beverly Pepper Between Toadie and the World. And we had received the invitation to this exhibit from our daughter, Julia, who was then working for Beverly Pepper. Julia worked for her for five years. And the invitation read, on December 8th, the first of a fabulous series of events that will mark the history of contemporary art in Italy, an exhibition of unpublished photographs, sculptures from the artist's private collection and the model of the Beverly Pepper Sculpture Park opening September in Todi. And it did open, in fact, in September in 2019. And it will be in the majestic Sala delle Pietre in the medieval town hall. And here we are in the Sala delle Pietre. Now this photograph at the end of the Sala delle Pietre is of the Todi these massive core 10 steel columns erected in the piazza in 1979. Beverly Pepper herself later said, so many people said to me years after, we really didn't understand what they were about and the beauty of them. Now, of course, Beverly Pepper is an esteemed uh, personage in Toadie, very loved, very remembered. She died in 2020. I think she was 97 at the time of her death. At this exhibit in 2018, Beverly Pepper was there. This is a model of what will be the Beverly Pepper Park, which will be opening in September of 2019 near the fortress and the columns that were in the Piazza in 1979 and are now actually, I believe, in Venice in a museum were going to be copied by Beverly Pepper and placed in the park of Beverly Pepper. Um, I want to read what Julia, our daughter, wrote about Beverly Pepper's work. She wrote, her sense of monumentality does not come from her home, New York City, her skyscrapers of New York City, but from Italy and Rome with its obelisks and columns and bell towers and tall towers. Monumentality for Beverly Pepper is not just about being big. It is especially about withstanding the passage of time, the weather, and the seasons. So she loves core 10 steel, which shows rust, but is also durable. And, Be and this is our daughter at this exhibit, and explain she was working for then for Beverly Pepper, so she was very happy to explain to everyone and answer any questions about the work and so forth. Here she's explaining to this gentleman something, and this is our my husband Pino, our son Keegan there, and they're looking here at the model of um, the Beverly Pepper Park. This is a picture of Julia with Beverly Pepper, and this was taken by um, John Pepper, Beverly Pep one of Beverly Pepper's two children. And Julia wrote these words shortly after learning about the death of the sculptor Beverly Pepper on February 5th, 2020. Julia wrote this, I always referred to Beverly as an incredible woman, a word often used lightly, but not when referred to a woman, an artist like her. It was hard to believe many of her stories and achievements. It is hard to believe how free and strong-willed she was and how incredible in her art. I was blessed to have spent five years working at her side and then having her as a friend, a mentor, inspiration, 
and the embodiment of the woman I hope to be one day. Rest in peace, Beverly Pepper. You and Bill were as important to me as my own parents in teaching me what life is and how we should live it courageously, dangerously, as you often said, freely and fully. The New York Times referred um, in Beverly Pepper's obituary, referred to her as a sculptor of monumental lightness. Beverly Pepper would have been pleased I think, because I wrote a blog note. In fact, she told me she was pleased. I wrote a blog note after seeing this show, and I called her the woman of gentle force, and I was delighted to hear that um, the New York Times obituary talked about her monumental lightness. Her sculptures are extraordinary. They have extraordinary strength and force, but there is something so gentle about them. This is one of her sculptures. And this is in 2018 at the exhibit with Julianne Pino. And this sculpture is called The Embrace. It is now in the Beverly Pepper Park. It is in um, stainless steel, Enex steel. It was sculpted in 1963, <clears throat> and she also designed all the benches in the park. And they have these gentle curves, and they seem to blend with nature as much as the sculptural pieces do. Uh, this is the paint. This is the sculpture embrace, I believe, and this one is also in the Beverly Park, and it is called Ingresso. This was it at the show in December two thousand eighteen, and outside the building in the Piazza del Popolo were the toady columns that she had erected um, in the piazza in nineteen seventy nine and are now in a museum in Venice. But copies of the Toady columns are also in the Beverly Pepper Park in Toady. So this is called Ingresso, or the entrance. Uh, she did this in 1967, and it is in the, um, in the park of Beverly Pepper in Toady. It was hard to congratulate her at that show. Uh, she was besieged by many, many fans that day. And we enjoyed the show with some of our friends, uh, Silvana from Rome and Mauro, her husband, and Frank, our friend from Rhode Island who's often in Italy. And they were going to be with us later for that, um, the following year for the inauguration of the Beverly Pepper Park. Here they are before the huge photo taken in 1979 when the toady columns were standing in Piazza del Popolo. This is a photo of Beverly Pepper at work in the forge. Taken many, many years prior. Here you can see all the people at this exhibit in the Sale delle Pietri in the 13th century medieval city hall of Todi. And outside were copies of the famous Todi columns which would then be moved to the park. Uh, we were at the inauguration of the Parco di Beverly Pepper in Todi in September of uh, 2020 and with some of our friends. And here we all are behind the sculpture Ingresso. Excuse me. The, the, this is the inauguration of the park, pardon me, not 2020, but 2019. And here are the toady columns, two of them. And this is a photo from the Beverly Pecker, Pepper Foundation, uh, the toady columns. These, again, are copies of the 1979 toady columns. And the park stretches in a, quite an area of toady. And these columns are placed near the 14th century remains of a papal fortress called La Roca. Uh, this is the inauguration of the Beverly Pepper Park, uh, the ribbon being symbolically cut by the mayor at the time. 
And I'd like to read you what Beverly Pepper wrote about her park. This is not Beverly Pepper's park, but that of the people of Todi, in the hopes that they will continue to look beyond what they can see. I hope they will ply their imaginations and creative powers and not remain forever anchored to their history, but rather join with it to create new chapters of beauty. My hope is that they will always find that courage. Now, we're here in the area where the toady columns are, and then we're about to start our walk through the Beverly Pepper Park. We stopped at the Sculptor Embrace. Remember, it was done in 1963. This is my friend Silvana, Chip and Cynthia, friends actually, who were once in Boston. I think they're now in New Hampshire, if I'm not incorrect. And Mauro, also a Roman friend. And you can see here the beautiful benches which Beverly Pepper designed and how they absolutely blended into the landscape. And as I looked out at the landscape, I was remembering what she had said. She wanted her sculptures to be a tie to the landscape. And some, one of the sculptures actually seemed to be pointing at a medieval wall. So she wanted her sculptures to be tied to this landscape of the area of Todi, which she loved so very much. This one is called Trinita. This is in steel, done in 1979. And at the inauguration, there were families, the children enjoying the sculptures. And again, these benches made by Beverly Pepper. This one council seemed to me to be pointing at the medieval wall. And Beverly Pepper, uh, I think she, these words, I think she wrote to me at one time. Or, or she told them to me when I asked her, what do you wish your sculptures convey to people? She had said, many of my monumental works reach to the sky, seeking a tie with the landscape. And look at how this is tied to the landscape. It seems to be pointing at the medieval walls. It seems to be pointing upwards at the trees. Council, done in 1973. Um... Ingresso, the entrance, done in 1967. In the 1960s, Beverly Pepper started to work in highly polished surfaces. She wanted the highly polished surfaces to engage the landscape. And look here at the reflection of the landscape in the stainless steel. So we walked through the Beverly Pepper Park, ending up at the... Renaissance Church, Santa Maria della Consolazione. So we passed through the park, passing 20 sculptural masterpieces of contemporary, and Amer contemporary American artists. And these sculptural masterpieces led us through nature to Todi's Renaissance masterpieces. This is what just what Beverly Pepper would have wished. And we thank you and rest in peace. And near today, the Santa Maria della Consolazione Renaissance Masterpiece, started in 1508, are the St. Martin Altars in cast iron, Beverly Pepper, 1993. So thank you for joining me. And may we soon together visit Todi and take in together this wonderful amalgamation of medieval art, Renaissance art, and contemporary masterpieces. Mille grazie, special thanks for being with me for this Todi adventure, and I'd like to thank those of you who have made donations and those who will make donations, which enable me to continue this work. It's been enjoyable to be in Todi. Again, as mentioned, since I've started doing these lectures, um, the good fortune of these times when I've been unable to guide on the streets and had to guide differently virtually is the increase in my knowledge of these gems of our Umbria. Grazie, grazie.